So Sabine Hassenfelder wrote a blog and posted a video on determinism a few days ago. I want to explain what it is that she is saying, some obvious problems with what she's saying, and then I want to step back and talk about what I think is really going on here. So Hassenfelder is a research uh, theoretical physicist, which makes her very smart. She's one of the smartest people around. And she's saying that determinism is true. She's certain of it. And what does that mean? What is determinism? So let me give you an example. Think of if I drop this pencil. From your high school physics, you know how long it's going to take to hit the floor, how fast it's going to go, how hard it's going to hit the floor. All of that is determined from the stuff you learned in high school physics. Determinism is that on steroids. It's, it's saying that the entire universe is like that pencil. Everything is determined by natural laws. The entire trajectory of not just a pencil, not just a few atoms, not just a few molecules, but the entire universe. And not just for a few seconds or a few minutes, for the entire history of the universe. Go back to the beginning of time, trace out the entire history of the entire universe, it's all determined. Everything is set in stone from the beginning according to these natural laws. That's determinism in a nutshell. It gets in more interesting when it's applied to people. So determinism, um, it, 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 at least according to Hassenfelder, applies to us as well, including the human mind. So. Now we're talking about free will. There is no such thing as free will, according to Hassenfelder. All of your thoughts, all of your thinking, all of your actions are predetermined because your mind, your brain, is just, again, particles moving according to natural laws. So everything is all uh, predetermined, preordained. Let me give you another example. Let's say you're going somewhere in your car and you're trying to decide whether you should get gas. You're looking at a number of things. You're weighing a lot of different factors. Um, the gas gauge. How much gas do I have? Where's the nearest gas station? How far do I need to go? Am I going to get into traffic? What's the likelihood of a, a traffic jam? Uh, will there be gas stations near where I'm going? Is the gas cheaper somewhere else? Uh, may, can I get gas on the way home if I'm low on gas? All these things are factoring into your thinking. And by the way, this is all very important in economics, for example, uh, which assumes that people act in their own best interests and make decisions locally and so forth. So according to this Hassenfelder's free will hypothesis, um, all of that was predetermined. All of your thinking, your decision, you didn't make a free will decision about where to get gas. That was all predetermined. The gas gauge setting was predetermined. Every thought you had about whether or not to get gas, weighing those different options. Those were all predetermined. What you did could have been predicted with a powerful enough computer and all the knowledge, if you had all the knowledge of everything in the universe, from the very beginning. That billions of years ago, it was predicted that you would go through that thought process and make that decision. So it, you can see things get a little strange here with this uh, determinism and free will. Okay, so that's, that's what she is saying in a nutshell. Um, what are the problems with this? Well, kind of taking off from what I just explained, free will is something we experience all the time. Everybody all the time experiences free will. Getting your gas, making your decisions, it's from you wake up to when you go to sleep. Uh, we're all making decisions, exercising free will all the time. So the idea that there's no free will is, from the very beginning, a pretty heroic, challenging claim. It doesn't really comport with the data at hand. We experience free will. Um, Hassenfelder acknowledges this. She realizes there's this, it goes against our, our experience. And the way she casts the problem is it's evidence against evidence. You have evidence for natural law, and you have evidence of personal experience, and those are butting up against each other. One of them has to win out. So she's, she's, form, she's formulating and framing the problem as a battle between these two, as opposed to seeing how they can work together. And she concludes that 
uh, the natural law wins out. Uh, in fact, it's not really a conclusion. It's actually kind of an assertion. It, it's something she starts with. She just makes a bare assertion, which is a logical fallacy. She simply states, well, the natural law must win out. That must be true. Uh, every decision we make, all the things we do are all preordained because, well, that's just what natural law does. And what we think is free will, our experience, must be some sort of an illusion. So her argument here really is not really an argument. It's just a bare assertion. So that's problem number one. She's got a lot of evidence against her, and instead of wrecking you with it, she simply makes a leap, makes a bare assertion. She isn't really aware that she's making this bare assertion. This is kind of a strange thing. She, she makes the assertion as though it's a given, as though it's self-evident. And she's very confident about this. She is supremely confident. And that brings us to the second problem I want to talk about, which is epistemology. She makes a lot of truth claims, very confident, as I said. How can she be confident? How can she know these things? According to her determinism and her free will, everything was preordained from the beginning, how can you know that that would be true? How is there any truth value with something that's preordained? Let me give you an example. Uh, let's say I decide to type out 2 plus 2 equals 5. In fact, I did that. 2 plus 2 equals 5. Well, according to Hassenfelder, that would be predetermined. That's preordained. I didn't actually decide to do that. That's something that was preordained billions of years ago. Of course, Hassenfelder would also agree that that is false. It's not true. So clearly, right off the bat, we have this little problem that preordained things are not necessarily true. In fact, I'm being kind, right? Frankly, there's no reason to think that something that is preordained by the law of gravity, uh, electrostatics, uh, thermodynamics, the, the natural laws that we know, why would why would they produce truth? Uh, that just does. There's no there's no necessary correspondence. There's no obvious. There's not even any implied correspondence between the results of natural law and truth. And so, according to Hassenfeld's own ideas and all the own hypothesis, epistemology is out the window. You have no assurance of anything uh, that anything you think or say is true. And yet she's highly convinced, supremely confident, that she's right. So there's a couple of quick problems. There's many more problems with her position. I'm giving you a couple that are pretty obvious, should come across pretty easily. She's arguing against an enormous amount of evidence. And uh, she has no reason to think that anything she says has any truth value. Uh, going again, And yet she has that. Um, that, that confidence. So there's an internal contradiction there. She doesn't really recognize these problems, either one of these two problems. Okay, so that's what she said. Those are the problems, some, some of the problems with what she said. And I want to finish up by stepping back and saying, okay, what's, what's really going on here? Here we have something interesting. I hope you kind of see, I hope a red flag kind of popped up for you because on the one hand, you have someone who is frankly, brilliant, right? We can say she's extremely smart. She's in the top, you know, what, one percentile, 0.1 percentile, whatever. She's, she's a theoretical research physicist, top brains in the world, right? And she's saying something that is, frankly, ridiculous. It's just, just to be frank, this is really absurd. Um, she, she says we're just simply, uh, the, the, the entire universe is just, just simply playing out from the very beginning of time uh, at preordained processes. Every book that was ever written, every song that was ever written, every creative thought, at least what we thought was a creative thought, uh, was actually something that was just preordained by the laws of, of nature. Every, uh, the works of Bach and Beethoven, they're all just preordained. And this, is, this gets very silly very fast. What's going on here? How could someone so brilliant come up with something so ridiculous? And so I want to step back and, and look at Isaiah and look at Paul, writers in the Bible who explained 
that we are naturally at enmity with God. That's what we are. We're just um, against God. That's our natural tendency. We will seek any way around God. And determinism and the lack of free will are our example of way there's, there's a lot of metaphysical and religious implications of these of these of these these positions i'm not I, i'm not uh, talking about hassenfelder here in particular but just in general these positions have deep metaphysical implications for example about the judgment of god uh, our sin um, how can how can god judge us if we are just simply automatons we're just robots acting out preordained trajectories a lot of religious implications here, and this is uh, this is the, a project. Uh, one uh, example of the human project of trying to get a, around God, and Isaiah and Paul explain this, and they say that we'll even go so far as to engage in foolishness and absurdity, and it, and they talk about how. Um, the wisdom of the world is foolish. The top teachers, teach, we, we will arrange and, and, and um, assemble teachers for ourselves who will tickle our ears, but it will be foolishness. So that's, that's uh, Sabine Hassenfelder, and that's it for this time. Uh, religion drives science, and it matters. Thanks. <laughs>